Let's begin our examination of middle adulthood. See if you can determine what ages it would be beginning and ending. Hopefully you are willing to say 40 or 45 to 60 or 65. For most people in middle adulthood, their health is excellent, or at least good, 85%. But that does mean 15% of people have significant issues with health. It might be a health crisis, such as perhaps cancer, or it might be chronic health conditions, such as heart disease, diabetes, uh, respiratory issues. These are significant issues, and living in poverty enhances the risk of many issues and strongly predicts early death. So in middle adulthood, some of our options are declining. Physical decline becomes more noticeable, whether it's the stairs you use to bound up, maybe three or four flights, you find that you maybe have to stop at the top and breathe for five seconds. Uh, the yard work that you used to do in one day, maybe you spread over two days or start to pay for if you can afford it. A shift from time since birth to time left to live begins, but more towards the end of the stage for most people, especially at the uh, big important birthdays. For many decades of life since early childhood, Accents were the leading killer. During middle adulthood, this is no longer the case. The leading cause of death at 40 is no longer accidents. As you can see from the chart, cancer is number one, heart disease number two, and then accidents, uh, unintentional injury, are the third cause. How do these three top middle adulthood death causes compare to uh, the major death causes for Americans of all age across the board. Well, stop and consider that for a moment. If you look at uh, causes of death for Americans, you'll find that these are the top three, but in a different order. Heart disease is the leading killer of Americans, followed by cancer, and then uh, accidents. So some are just rearranged. In the next few slides, we'll look at physical changes. I decided to start with teeth. So the need for expensive procedures such as uh, root canals, bridges, implants, all increased dramatically starting in middle adulthood. Even with dental insurance, which I checked, 50% of Americans have, and it's actually 50 point something, so it's literally 50%. Uh, most cost, even with insurance, is out of pocket. And these procedures can Close to be close to a thousand for several of them, such as the implants, several thousand, all out of pocket. Vision, uh, presbyopia, cannot adjust for distance anymore. Your lenses have gotten too thick inside your eye. So you'll need glasses for the first time. If you've already had glasses for a while, you might need bifocals. If you had bifocals for a while, you'll probably need trifocals. Most people start to notice poor vision in terms of dim light. What do you think the biggest dim light vision would be for most adults? I don't know, not getting to the bathroom. It would be driving at night. Less color vision. And risk of eye issues, eye diseases, such as, hmm, think what you can think about, and the next slide we'll discuss it more. So I'll leave that one to you to ponder. Uh, hearing changes, hearing declines, often uh, subtly at first. It's often first in the higher pitches. This does not occur in all societies, and certainly not with all people within a society. Uh, gender differences. Uh, men are affected earlier, probably related to their work and hobbies. Do most HMOs provide hearing aids? Uh, no, though since the last time I taught this course, over-the-counter hearing aids are available, and many of them compare very nicely with the prescription ones at hundreds of dollars less. Uh, look at the features and shop carefully. Uh, 
uh, I would take this moment to say protect your hearing. Uh, lawn mowing is very high at hearing damaging levels, so is snow blowing for that matter, as does listening to rock music in many venues. Uh, you can buy yourself for maybe $30, $35. I know it's not cheap, but like those look like earmuffs, heavy duty for the outside work. At a venue, you can get uh, hearing uh, plugs that will help, his stewards even. Uh, if you don't find any, just a little bit of toilet paper balled up in your ear. Uh, I do this. It's my favorite band in the world. It's not worth losing my hearing for. So just consider that. You always have that option of toilet paper, you know, paper towel. Charge your hearing well. So as you ponder diseases of the eye, which can lead to vision loss or blindness on the last slide, what did you come up with? I assume cataracts. Most people know somebody who's had cataract surgery, whether they're a peer or a parent or a grandparent or a friend of a family. There's also glaucoma, uh, too much pressure causing the subtle, slow loss of vision, which the person usually does not recognize. There's also macular degeneration related to neuron death in the retina. These cells line the back of the eye that are responsible for vision. So take a look at these slides. You can see clearly one is normal vision, which hopefully matches yours. But which one's cataracts, which one's glaucoma, and which one is macular degeneration? Top right would be the early stages of cataracts. Bottom left where the center is gone, that's macular degeneration. So wouldn't that be annoying that you, what your eye focuses on is what you specifically cannot see? And the bottom right, that so loss of the peripheral vision that the person doesn't even notice. Uh, that would be macular degeneration. So in middle adulthood, skin changes are increasingly more noticeable. The skin thins, it wrinkles, age spots, or if you prefer wisdom spots appear. Blood vessels become more apparent in part because the skin is thinning, so they're more obvious. The skin becomes drier. It may sag, especially in the face and arms. Women are more prone to this than men. Fat buildup due to metabolism slowing. So if you eat the same, you will gain weight. Men tend to get it in the less healthy areas of the upper abdomen. They also get it in the back. Women, lower abdomen and upper arms. Some aspects of this aging, uh, such as fat, controllable through diet and exercise. Other aspects, such as the skin, uh, limited if not, if any at all. Let's now consider the risk for serious conditions such as diabetes, heart attack, stroke, cancer, dementia, and so on. Let's consider cancer in middle adulthood. As we saw in the previous slide, cancer is the leading killer. The type varies strongly by region. For example, the Cabell district has a very high prevalence of pancreatic cancer. If we look at New York State, uh, we are 11th in terms of how common it is, uh, first being the county that has it the most, and the capital district area would be the 11th. Uh, for example, if I walk out my office door and take a few steps to the left, I can see an office where a colleague uh, used to reside that had died of pancreatic cancer. And if I go to the right a few feet, I can go to a different office where another colleague has died from pancreatic cancer. The survivability of cancer depends very much on the type and how advanced it is. Uh, pancreatic cancer is one of the more lethal cancers. Uh, as so is, uh, for example, for so is additionally uh, ovarian cancer. 60% of people survive cancer for at least five years. And as we noted earlier, cancer deaths are actually on the decline and I was surprised, uh, they've been declining every year for 30 years. In part due to better detection and better treatments, particularly for breast cancer. What's the overall survival rate of cancer in the US right now? It very strongly by type of cancer and state, uh, stage the person is identified in. 
but still overall currently it's 90 percent when i was a kid uh, i checked the numbers on that it was 75 percent and as time passes with more and more effective treatments you'll see it even go above 90. so good news Let's consider the use it or lose it principle applied specifically to exercise. The benefits of exercise include all the following, and certainly a lot more. Builds muscle, increases metabolism, which can help avoid the yearly increase of weight, which is often occurring middle adulthood, during the middle adulthood. Helps to control blood sugar, increases bone density, relieves stress, enhances sleep, and also has been shown to decrease anxiety and to decrease depression. But how many middle adults exercise at all? And how many do enough to achieve actual health benefits? Consider that for a moment before I tell you the answer. So what percent exercise at all? Half. But what percent exercise frequently enough and long enough to achieve any real actual health benefits? 20%. That being said, though, anything's better than nothing. Let's now consider heart disease in middle adulthood, which, as you probably remember, is the second leading cause of death. Before we get into the slide, I'd like to ask you to consider heart attack symptoms in men versus women. Consider the ones that you know the same, and do you know any are different? So let me give you a moment. Please don't peek. Try to do it like you would in class. And think of male, female, and shared heart attack warning symptoms. Go ahead, actually do it. heart disease in middle adulthood, specifically the heart attack. We know it's not the leading killer, but still causes a whopping 25% of all deaths in middle adulthood. So a good question to know the answer to, are there warning signs not in the hours before a heart attack, but are there warning signs in the weeks before a heart attack? And you might say no, or usually no. You'd be wrong. Women much more so than men, and if you're curious how much 80% of women will have symptoms for a full month before their heart attack. This could have prevented the heart attack whatsoever, the damage associated with it, and in many instances, saving their life. Men can have these symptoms too, but just less likely. Three key ones. Uh, trouble kept catching your breath. Another one, insomnia that is new and the last one, extreme fatigue when you don't have good reason. So what were they? Trouble catching your breath, extreme fatigue, insomnia, and some people just do mention a vague discomfort in the chest, like maybe you maybe overexert yourself muscle-wise when you have it. So be aware of those. And if you have people in your life, I'm sure you do, that are middle adulthood or older, especially women, share those features because they would probably not recognize it even if they were having it as you were talking to them. Heart disease is related to 25% of death in middle adulthood and is the second leading cause of death. It's accompanied by typically the silent killers, high blood pressure typically for years or decades, high cholesterol and atherosclerosis, uh, I assume you know it's a heart-related term, but do you know what it specifically means? If you do, it's great, and if you don't, well, that's fine too. It refers to the fatty buildup in arteries, which reduce blood flow and make strokes all the more likely. Now let's turn to the heart attack symptoms that you were thinking of. Most people think of the chest pain, crushing, or the shooting pain that goes down the arm, and certainly that does occur, and in men is the most primary symptom, 
but there are many other symptoms as well, and women often do not show that presentation. Nausea is a major symptom in men, shortness of breath, and breaking into a cold sweat. I should say that men can also have any of the quote-unquote female symptoms, but those are a less common uh, presentation. So let's look at women. They can have any of the quote-unquote male symptoms, but less than 40% uh, have chest pain. So what do they have? They're much more likely to have severe neck, jaw, throat, or back pain. And very typically would not recognize that, and often their family or people they're with, coworkers, often would not recognize that. So again, neck and jaw are much more common presentations in women. But it could also be throat pain, back pain, actual vomiting, the cold sweat. But often, weeks before the heart attack, she is experiencing sleep issues of unknown cause and is complaining about being extremely fatigued. Interestingly and sadly, women often have one or more symptoms a month before their heart attack and are not recognizing it and not acting on it. You might say, well, how often is often? 80% of women, I'll say that again, 80% of women have symptoms before their heart attack for at least a month and are not seeking medical help. So what to do with this? Well, first of all, if you're not the heart attack age yourself, maybe consider the people in your life that are heart attack age and have a little conversation with them. Just say, today in class we learned about this. Can you tell me common symptoms of heart attack in men and women? And then maybe educate them. This might be your parents. Uh, I talk to my uh, aunt every day, and when she tells me I'm extremely tired, I ask her, okay, what did you do today? She tells me I raked the lawn. I'll say, well, maybe you should rake half as much. She lives in a different state, so I can't help her. But make sure the people in your life are aware of these symptoms. It just might save their life. I find that most of my students are confused as to what menopause means. Similarly, they're confused to, strange enough, and I learned human sexuality, what the word vagina means. But anyway, let's focus on menopause, starting with first, though, perimenopause and climacteric. Perimenopause, or climacteric, is the time that's leading up to menopause. During this time, periods become irregular. Sleep issues often start. The woman often, though not always, has hot flashes and night sweats. You may be surprised to know that half of women avoid hot flashes and night sweats altogether. The usual length of perimenopause or the climacteric is seven years, but unfortunately some women can have it for twice as long. Now what menopause actually means is the time in which the period or less menstrual cycle has ceased for at least 12 months. So menopause isn't the time leading up to it. Menopause is actually uh, after it has stopped. Average age is 51, but there's a, quite a bit of variability, especially within families. And even though she's in menopause, many women still continue to have hot flashes or night sweats. In the next slide, we'll see a new medication, which might be very helpful. Let's consider benefits and drawbacks. You might be surprised that there might be a benefit or a drawback, but there are each. Take a moment, don't peek, maybe close your eyes if you have to, and think as many as you can. Go ahead and humor your teacher if you will. So benefits and drawbacks. Benefits, freed from menstruation and freed from risk of pregnancy. Drawbacks, some women regret or loss of fertility or even think that they're less feminine or less of a woman. Her risk of osteoporosis increases sharply. There are also sexual changes. The tissue of the vulva and the vagina both thin. If you're not familiar with the term vulva, uh, maybe take a peek and look it up. She will produce less lubrication, which will make intercourse less comfortable. Well, there are treatments and we will consider them. The risk of STI increases sharply because men and women of this age are not using condoms because they're not fearing pregnancy. So actually this particular population has a surprisingly high rate of STIs. 
including HIV. Let's consider benefits and drawbacks. Benefits, free from menstruation's inconvenience, discomfort, and cost. Birth control to prevent pregnancy is not needed, so free from that inconvenience, the money, and sometimes the health risks associated with it. Drawbacks, some women regret the loss of their fertility and feel less feminine. Risks of some conditions actually increase dramatically. Uh, can you think of the best answer for that? Osteoporosis. Sexual changes, uh, thinning of the vulva and vaginal tissues, in other words, external and internal, and less lubrication. And a dramatic, if you are in the dating pool, dramatic increase in the risk of STIs because everybody's abandoned uh, condoms because pregnancy is an issue, but STIs certainly are. Uh, there's a surprising uh, high rate of STIs in sexually active uh, older people with multiple partners. Well, I thought I'd mention for the pain of menstruation, uh, the cramps, uh, people that are uh, male gender identified from birth, uh, you probably obviously don't know what that is. So think of if you've ever had very bad diarrheal cramps that are very bad and painful, pretty similar. Almost all cis women, if they live long enough, will experience menopause. So let's tackle this topic. Uh, interestingly, many students and many people confuse the word menopause. I find similarly in my human sexual ed class, many students are confused as to what the word vagina means. But anyway, that's another pot, point altogether. So let's consider uh, medical management of menopause. A new drug called gabapentin is very useful in controlling night sweats and hot flashes. Night sweats and hot flashes can be very uh, life interrupting. For example, often if a woman has severe uh, on night sweats, uh, it will wake her up. She'll have to maybe change her clothes or move to a different bed or the sheets. Uh, she may not get back to sleep. Management in the past often included ERT or HRT. Do you know either one of these acronyms? ERT, estrogen replacement therapy, HRT, hormone replacement therapy. They were once the gold standard but after some very large tests, uh, one uh, had over 40,000 40, uh, nurses, they actually stopped the test because they were seeing an alarmingly high increase of heart attacks in that population. So once a common treatment, now uh, typically not. Uh, other issues include uh, stroke and uh, some cancers as well. Osteoporosis is a very common issue later in life in women and in some men. Healthy lifestyle can help. Let's look at our risk factors. Think of yourself when you look at this list. Your sex. Females have much higher risk, but men get osteoporosis too. For example, Eric Erickson died of a broken hip, presumably related to osteoporosis. Race, uh, uh, white women and Asian women have a much higher rate than African American women. Tobacco users have a much higher rate. If you have a slender build, higher risk. If your exercise is what you would consider to be low or what any reasonable person would consider to be low, that's a risk. Heavy alcohol or caffeine use. Early menopause. Poor nutrition. Poor general health. A family history of osteoporosis. And maybe you don't know the person's uh, diagnosis, but if you had a grandparent that walked in a very stooped over manner, uh, that is osteoporosis. Anorexia, low vitamin D, and many meds. And this is just a couple that I've listed here, meds for epilepsy, meds for cancer, if you've had a joint injections. The time to start strengthening your bones is now early in life, long before menopause. And if you're guys, well, it's still time to start strengthening your bones.
as noted, osteoporosis is a common issue later in life, so the need to strengthen bones is before you arrive there. If you work on it at that point, the train has basically left the station. Maximum bone density for women is achieved at the latest by 40, usually a few years before that. Once a person, once a woman or a, a person uh, assigned female birth hits menopause, that person can lose five or even 10% of bone density a year. So maximizing and, and keeping it is essential to health and survival. It really should be managed by a specialist, but who, who is a specialist? An endocrinologist, so personal opinion here, every woman should have an endocrinologist by the time she's hitting menopause. How common is bone fracture due to osteoporosis? Take a guess. So again, how co common is bone fracture due to osteoporosis? You're thinking 20%, 15%, try 50%. Again, uh, why it's so critical to uh, manage bones as, if, uh, as much as possible. In terms of perimenopausal and menopausal issues, Asian women seem to have less of a problem. Is it perhaps the estrogen that they're taking in in soy and adamani? Not clear, but lucky them. Let's consider disability. At the beginning of middle adulthood, less than 10% are disabled, and many were disabled before middle adulthood. By the beginning of late adulthood, it jumps to 30%. That's a huge increase, obviously. Lower SES individuals have a significantly enhanced risk. Osteoporosis is thinning of the bone. Uh, you can see bottom left, good healthy bone tissue. On the right, lots of gaps, much easier to break. I'm sure we've all heard about the uh, older person, the older woman that falls and breaks a hip. That obviously does happen, but in many cases it's the opposite. She is standing, her hip crumbles underneath her, then she falls. just double checked a statistic that I want to share. You might not think of hip fractures as being a fatal condition, but they certainly can be with seniors. What percent of women do you think are dead within a year of breaking a hip? You might be thinking 5% and 10%, actually a third, and uh, men can also die of obviously the hip fracture too. I thought it'd be interesting for you to take a look at the risk factors for having a uh, osteoporotic condition, osteoporosis, uh, the more things you say yes to, the more risk you have. And guys, uh, people male gen identified at birth might be inclined not to do this, but you look at the very first item is sex. Uh, being assigned male at birth is a protective factor. Being assigned female at birth is a risk factor. Men get osteoporosis too. They die of hip fractures. If you think of, uh, I have to get back to you on this. A major uh, psychology figure did die of a broken hip. And I hope you know his mind will pop into, name will pop into my memory at the end of this. Okay, sex, we said male gender identified at worth is a protection. So if you're female, put a yes for that. Uh, race. Asian and Caucasian Americans have the highest risk, so if you're saying yes to either one of those, that's a risk. Tobacco user, big risk, I'd almost say, no, but anyway. Build, slender and tall. Exercise level, low. Uh, alcohol use, if you say yes, risk factor. Caffeine use, if it's moderate or heavy, that's, uh, that's a yes. Nicotine use, uh, definitely yes. Early menopause risk, poor nutrition, risk, uh, particularly low in things that would be calcium related, such as dairy, uh, poor general health, a risk, 
family history of it, or you have women in the family that are way hunched over, and that's osteoporosis. Uh, anorexia, yes. If you take medications for certain conditions such as epilepsy or cancer, or if you had uh, cortisone uh, uh, joint injections. And I will now go check the see if what I'm thinking about for the major psychologist who died of osteoporosis is, is correct or not before I give you the name. I was not able to identify the major psychologist who died of hip fracture. If you can find it, send me the name and I'll give you a bonus point and add it to the slide. <laughs> but anyway. And I believe it's a stage theorist, and I went through every stage theorist. There's one that I can find died of infection, which could easily be, but I don't want to give out the name if it's, I can't find anything that specifically said infection due to hip fracture. So there you go, sadly. Sex after 40 and after 50 and 60 and often 70, 80 or above is still a thing. Might be modified, but it's still a thing as if people get older. It is the single best predictor of relationship satisfaction. As people go older though, partner availability becomes an increasingly a uh, big issue. Earlier in the course, we learned that fertility changes in men and women both tend to start at 35, though very quickly for women, very slowly for men. This would be due in no small part to plummeting uh, hormone levels testosterone in males and estrogen and to a lesser extent progesterone in females. This produces common issues in both men and women. Male issues would be erection uh, difficulties, uh, sometimes due to heart issues. So a man with erection difficulties should have it checked with his doctor to make sure he's not having some of the silent killers occurring that might be damaging his heart. Common treatments are now including Cialis, Viagra, and other medications as well. Female issues, we had mentioned earlier, lack of lubrication. This can be treated with lubricants particularly specific for sex. Uh, picture below a uh, generic CVS brand and the uh, more famous uh, Neum brand, KY Jelly. The tissue thins of the vulva and the vagina, uh, in case you didn't look up vulva, vulva is the female external genitalia the labia, uh, the clitoris, and so on. So many women, when they're talking about their labia and vagina and related tissue, use the term vagina. Well, vagina is the internal cylindrical structure, which is like a hollow tube that's rather collapsed. Very different. In terms of thinning of the tissue, uh, topical coconut uh, or a topical estrogen can be very helpful. The topical estrogen does not have the risk of estrogen taken orally, it becomes systemic. The double standard of aging says that men continue to be sexually attractive or even increase in sexual attraction as they age, while as women they just get old and decline. For example, uh, actors that are female often lament that their roles dramatically decrease as they age. Not so with male actors. So uh, an example of one of the isms in this one, uh, ageism and combined with the intersectionality many times of sexism. It's fair to say that many employ employers recognize the value of middle-aged or even late adulthood workers. As a group, they tend to be better face-to-face -face and phone communicators. Uh, they tend to quit less often, which means far less money has to go into training. A higher work ethic, more practical experience, and bring with them stronger professional and client networks. So, a good investment. Let's now consider cognitive change in middle adulthood. Let's think back to research methods specific for looking at how we change across time. Take a moment and see if you can remember those two. Uh, don't get them confused with the two methods that are designed to distinguish nature and nurture. Were you able to think of the cross-sectional and longitudinal study? Now let's focus on a researcher 
in the area of intelligence whose work particularly lends itself to this area of study. The researcher would be Raymond Cattell. Cattell po uh, proposes a dichotomous view of intelligence on two natures, two kinds. First would be crystallized, would be facts. This tends to peak in middle adulthood and remains pretty stable until the late 60s. Fluid intelligence is basically the ability to think. It includes thinking and reasoning, problem solving, your short-term memory, your speed of processing, uh, your math ability. When do these decline, crystallized and fluid? Uh, crystallized we already looked at, let's consider fluid on the next PowerPoint. Let's take a look at this chart looking at fluid intelligence. Let's ignore the perceptual speed, the purple line, and yellow, the numeric ability, since they have slightly different patterns than the rest of their fluid intelligence we're looking at. You'll notice great stability from the 40s, 39 or so, which would be the early part of middle adulthood, through about 60, which would be the tail end of middle adulthood. We'll only start seeing significant dips, and most of them tend to be gradual, starting 60 to 67. So we see a very similar pattern for fluid intelligence as we did for crystallized intelligence. And that might be our walk away. And what was the similarity? Well, holding steady and peaking in the 40s, showing slow decline starting at about 60.